Okay, well, I'll go ahead and start. So, so it's um, a pleasure to, to talk to you today about how to solve crimes, especially aquatic crimes, using insect evidence. So uh, this is called forensic entomology. And I'm going to be talking about a case, and this case is fictional. However, it is based on several actual cases that are in the, in the legal system. And this is just a, a compilation of some of the, um, the information about it. So as I said, this is for thick entomology, using insects in legal issues. And one of these issues is helping to solve crime. And we can help solve the crimes by determining the time of death. Because when there's uncertainty, then there's uncertainty about the suspect. And so ent entomology or insects can help us determine when um, the date of death occurred or close to it. So forensic entomologists are people who study these issues and they can help the police in terms of solving crimes by using the insect evidence to add to the other evidence that the police gain. And this is helpful because bodies will typically undergo a series of stages during decomposition and different insects will show up at each stage. When we examine what insects were there, we can find out how long the body has been there based on stages of decomposition it has gone through. Now, according to temperature and moisture conditions, so we have all these factors. But the different stages of decomposition on land in terrestrial habitats, um, we start at the first stage. That's when the body first dies. And um, that will last until the body starts to bloat. And again, this can be um, hours to days to weeks, depending on the temperature. But this fresh stage um, is usually on land occupied by some, some flies that can detect as soon as something dies. Um, they detect the odors of death and they immediately visit the carcass and then they start to um, feed and to overposit on it. And again, this is on land. But then the body um, starts to, to disintegrate internally and bacteria are working and, and breaking down the tissues. These bacteria release gases. So these gases start to stretch the body. So they stretch the body against the skin and the body starts to bloat. So this is a bloated stage and different insects appear during this bloat stage. Then we enter the decay stage. This is when the decomposing insects and the bacteria and fungi start to break through the skin and then the gases are released. And then we enter this active decay stage where the bacteria and the insects that are all feeding on the body and um, causing um, decomposition of the, of the tissues. After they eat the, the fleshy parts, then we enter the post-decay stage. And this is when the skin, the cartilage and the bone remain because these are a little bit more resistant to being consumed However, there are organisms that do specialize on feeding on skin and cartilage. And that's when these will show up and then they will disintegrate the skin and the cartilage until we leave only the skeletal stage. And that's when only the bones and the hair are left. So again, by picking up the insects from the carcass, we can determine what stage it's in and then how long it's been in that stage also by different ages of the insects, you know, whether they've first been laid as eggs or whether or not they're older. So on land, we have worked out this sequence pretty thoroughly, and we know a lot about what to expect. However, in water, we're still just in the beginning stages in terms of identifying how decomposition proceeds in water. So we call that aquatic forensic entomology, because the insects that live in water are totally different from the insects that live on land. And they have different habits and different patterns of when they would visit a body. But again, these have not all been worked out yet. So some of the stages are very similar to what we see on land, that they start out with the fresh body, 
And typically that fresh body will sink to the bottom of the, the water body, whether it's a long depth or, or a very shallow body of water, the body will sink initially. However, then it undergoes the bloat stage when the bacteria are disintegrating the tissues and the body fills with gases, then the body floats. So often somebody committing a murder might be surprised to find, uh-oh, they thought that body was gone, but now it's floating on the surface because it's in the bloat stage. And this is when the land insects can contact the body and start laying eggs on it. So even though these flies might never occur in water, when the body is floating on the surface, they can come land on the body, lay their eggs on it, the eggs hatch out in the larvae that will then feed on the body, and then the body will have both aquatic insects and then also these terrestrial flies living inside of it. But at the end of the bloat stage, then the tissue, the skin is broken, and the body starts to sink again. But now it's going to sink with these maggots in it or whoever visited the body while it was floating. And these terrestrial insects can't live underwater. And so often the body will sink and it will have these maggots in it, which then drown. And then the other um, aquatic insects will start feeding on the body or feeding on things that are growing on the body like algae. So we have aquatic insects that will come to the body. And then of course, underwater, we have a lot of other animals. We have crabs, we have turtles, crayfish. We have animals that want to come in they're just scavengers eating detritus. They will eat away at the body. So they can pick a significant part of the body also. So if we compare what goes on in the terrestrial, the land habitat versus the aquatic habitat, there's some major differences. Um, again, one is the insects. Now, I say water, I'm talking about fresh water because in salt water, most insects can't survive. So the aquatic insects are freshwater insects. So this refers to lakes and ponds and streams and, and maybe um, a bay where you, you get some fresh water coming in. But the difference is that um, typically the water is a lot colder than the, the land. And so the decomposition rates are slower on in the water than they are on land because it's colder. And again, temperature is going to regulate decomposition patterns. So the, the Progression through these different stages from the fresh to the bloated to the decay stage, these are all going to be slowed down and it's going to totally depend on the temperature. And bodies of water can vary tremendously in temperature depending on where they're located, you know, up north versus down south. And then also how deep they are because the deeper you go down, the colder it is. So all of this is going to have an impact on how quickly the body goes through these decomposition stages. So typically, um, if a body is brown and, and goes, to the, goes to the bottom of the water, um, then they will um, undergo the bloat stage more slowly than on land, and then they will float to the surface. That can take one to two weeks in very, very cold water, maybe in the winter in the north. Uh, it could take much longer. But typically, in a couple of weeks, the body will start to float again. And then how long they stay floating depends again on the temperature and the insect activity. Because as soon as there's enough activity to break the skin and to um, release the gases, then the body's going to sink again, again with some terrestrial insects on it. So this crime scene, again, a compilation of various um, crimes that actually happened, um, we're facing in November 2nd. And as a forensic um, entomologist, the, the local police asked me to go with them to a lake called Connor Lake to search for a submerged body because they knew once they found the body, they wanted to get the insects off it immediately. So they needed to have an entomologist with them. And they were searching for a person who had worked on a farm, a farm hand. His name was Mike Smith. And he was missing and they had searched all over for him and they suspected that he had drowned in the lake because it wasn't any place else. So the farm that adjoined the lake was a tobacco farm. It was owned um, by a man who essentially rented it out to his son-in-law, Brian Jones, 
Brian Jones worked the farm. And Mike Smith was the farmhand who helped Brian Jones um, grow the tobacco and, and, and harvest it. So occasionally they would hire day laborers to help out if they needed them. But um, these were the two main occupants of the farm. In addition to Brian Jones' family, he had a, a wife and child also. So Brian Jones was kind of a ne'er-do-well. He wasn't very competent and he wasn't a good farmer. So he couldn't make money growing tobacco and the tobacco industries had many challenges also, but he had to file for bankruptcy and, you know, he kept the farm going, but he was under bankruptcy and um, he wasn't making any money. So he, he really wasn't doing well. So one day, um, and this was in early, early summer, June 2nd, he was driving his pickup and the farm hand was in the back of the pickup. So Mike Smith was in the back and he was driving down a, a muddy road and a deer dashed across the road and Brian swerved to avoid it and he overturned the pickup. And unfortunately, Mike was in the back. He was pinned under the pickup. And according to Brian, he seemed dead. He, he had an injury. He wasn't moving. He thought he was dead. And Brian really did not want to call the police about this because when he uh, filed for bankruptcy, one of the conditions was that he could not have his truck, but he kept his truck. So he didn't want to call the police and tell them that he still had his truck because he wasn't allowed to have his truck. So he didn't call the police. And that's when it became a crime because he tried to conceal the truck. He went back to his farm, he, he got his tractor, he hooked the pickup truck to the tractor. There was a shed nearby, he towed it, the, the truck into the shed and he left it there. But then there was Mike um, injured and Brian said he thought he was dead. And so he just wanted to dispose of the body. He just wanted to get rid of the evidence that there had been a truck or any, any accidents. So what he did was he, um, he took the body to the lake, which was right nearby. So he dragged the body through the brush. And then there was a rowboat near the lake and he put the body into the rowboat. He rowed out to the center of the lake and then he just pushed Mike overboard. And then he rode away. And so um, he, again, assumed he was dead. He assumed he was just getting rid of evidence. However, um, this ended up being a, a major problem for him. So this was in early summer. So Brian continued to work at the farm throughout the summer. He, he worked on the, the tobacco. He hired day laborers to help him. He just didn't tell anybody about Mike Smith um, dying. And so um, it was finally noticed in, uh, in the fall because after harvest, usually that's when everybody got paid and Mike Smith would usually take his money down to town. He'd go to the bar and have a few drinks. And so people around there knew to expect Mike to show up in the fall after, after the harvest. And then Mike wasn't there. So they asked Brian, what happened to Mike? Where is he? And Brian said, oh no, he, um, after we harvested the tobacco, he just quit and he, he left town. So that was his explanation. However, people weren't satisfied about that. It, it was very atypical of Mike to leave town without telling anybody. And so they were suspicious and they contacted the police. So the police decided to investigate. They also thought um, there, was, there seemed to be no good reason for for Mike to disappear. So they went out to the farm and they, they questioned Brian about it. And Brian swore up and down that um, Mike had worked all summer long on the tobacco, that he had just left after the harvest and he didn't know where he had gone, he had just left. But the police weren't convinced, they, they thought it was fishy. And so they searched Brian's house, they had a farmhouse and they went through the house looking for any kind of evidence. They searched the farm, looking for any kind of evidence, the barns, the fields, they looked all over. They didn't see anything, but the lake was right there. And they figured, well, maybe, maybe he's drowned in the lake. So they decided to hire a diver, a forensic diver, to go out and look for the body. And 
Brian said, well, I don't think Mike is drowned in the lake. There's no evidence of it. However, if it did happen, it happened after he harvested the tobacco and he must have come back very recently and then somehow ended up drowning. If, if you find a body in there. So this is when the police contacted me to see if I could accompany the diver to collect insects off the body if a body was found in the lake. This is very common, again, for forensic entomologists to work closely with the police, with the pathologists, because all the evidence goes together. And the insect evidence and, and the other evidence that um, the police would collect can all paint a picture of what actually happened. Now, in aquatic cases, um, they often use dogs. So most people know how remarkable the sense of smell is in dogs. And this is true even if a body is deep underwater because the gases that are released from the decomposing body rise to the surface and then they, they leave the surface and, and go off into the atmosphere. Well, dogs can smell that. And so they will take dogs out, usually a set hound who's trained to um, search for cadavers. They'll take the dog out on the boat and then they will circle around until, and the dog is sniffing actively. It, it knows it's on a job. It keeps its nose close to the water and it sniffs deeply, trying to pick up these few molecules of, of decomposing human body. And this is, um, again, something that they routinely use um, dogs to help locate these bodies. Now, the dogs are not good divers. The dog can't dive in and go get the body. However, the dog can point out a, there's a body down there somewhere, then the diver goes down and gets the body. So in this case, they used a dog named Lucas, who was a scent hound, and the trainer took Lucas out into the center of the, of the lake and moved the boat around with Lucas sniffing intently at the water. And Lucas was trained that when he, he detected this odor, that he would give this yelp, this characteristic yelp, I found the body, it's down there. And so that's when the diver decided to go in and search there. So the diver went down in the spot that Lucas had indicated and he found the body. So he returned it to the surface and then that's when all the investigation starts um, collecting the insects so that they can be identified and staged and maybe determine time of death. So the specimens that um, I collected off this body, um, I had to be very careful with the chain of evidence, meaning that anything I collected had to be tamper proof and had to go through the police investigation. I had to identify them and then I had to account for these vials throughout the entire process. So each vial, was labeled, there's a special code for each crime. And so the crime scene code was on the label, the date that the specimen was collected, the location on the body where it was collected, because that's important too. Was the insect in the mouth? Was it in the fingers? Um, that can all provide evidence. And um, then these would be tracked throughout the investigation and, and kept secure so that nobody could tamper with the evidence. So the specimens that we found were three types of aquatic insect and one type of terrestrial fly. So one aquatic insect is called an, a coronamid, or it's a midge larva. Um, the other type is called ephemeroptera, or a mayfly. Um, and the third type was called trichopter, or a caddisfly. So these were all immature stages of these insects on the body, they might be feeding on the body or feeding on algae growing on the body. But we also found um, inside the body, low fly larvae that had drowned because they had colonized the body during the floating stage. And so there were maggots that came from a terrestrial flying fly on the floated body. But then when the body sunk again, it carried these maggots down with it and they all drowned because they were not aquatic insects. So here's something about the life histories of these various insects. So the coronamids 
are midges. And um, in the center here, we see a picture of an adult. They look very similar to mosquitoes. Many people think they're mosquitoes, but they don't suck blood. They don't have a lung proboscis. Um, they're just um, superficially similar to mosquitoes. And the larvae are very long and thin. Some of them are bright red. And that is because they have hemoglobin. They don't have blood, but they have the hemoglobin molecule to carry oxygen because they often live in very oxygen deprived water. And so they have to grab as much oxygen with this hemoglobin as possible, and that makes them bright red. So these are often called blood worms, and these blood worms are often used in pet food. You know, if you have tropical fish or whatever, you might feed them blood worms. That's what these are. These are midges, but you can find them out in nature um, very frequently. Um, there are many, many, many species of midges. So there's um, another species of midge that isn't red um, that's pictured here, but there are many different midge species and they all are down there, you know, potentially eating detritus and, um, and algae. Then we have the ephemeroptera and these are called mayflies. And these have nymphs, immatures that live underwater and again, are eating algae and detritus. When they are adults, they will um, essentially rise to the surface and then the adult will emerge and, and go off and fly and then mate and then lay eggs and drop them back into the water. So the adult stage is very brief. And that's why they're called ephemeroptera because ephemera refers to ephemeral, very brief period of time as adult. They don't feed, they don't do anything but mate when they're adults. So they come above the water, they find each other, they mate, and then the females fall dead on the water and, and their eggs pour out of them. And then they go back, the eggs go into the water and then the nymphs hatch out. So most of life history is spent as the nymph stage, again, feeding on detritus and algae down inside the water. Then we have the trichoptera. These are called caddisflies. And there, there are different types of caddisflies. Some of them weave cases. And you can see in the center here, we have a case that's made up of pebbles. So these caddisflies can make silk and they can um, attach the substrate of the, of the, the, the ocean, I mean, the um, lake floor or whatever onto it so that they are very hard to see. They're inconspicuous. So they've got silk and then this um, either pebbles or, or plants or whatever that they've attached to their case. And they move around living inside the case, again, feeding on algae and, and other materials. Now, some of them are predators and they actually make a little net out of their silk and will catch various um, insect prey in, in their little nets. But the ones that we were interested in were the ones that were feeding on the body um, and feeding on the algae on the body. So these are the trichopter or caddisflies. These are, for people who fish, these are often used as um, baits or they have artificial ones that, that they use as bait. But we also found some of these blowfly maggots in there. So this must have been when the body had resurfaced, it was, it was bloated and the blowflies laid eggs on on the um, corpse and the maggots were feeding on the corpse when again the skin broke the gases escaped and then the body sunk again well all those maggots were then drowned um, down in the, the depths when the body went to the bottom so if we look at the cap 40 these are very important these blowflies super important on land because they're the number one insect that colonizes a body, the first one they get there, they can find a body within minutes. As soon as something dies, they can smell it and they go straight to the body and start feeding on juices and laying their eggs on it. So they're the very first colonizers and they're very important in forensic entomology um, in terrestrial situations. But as you can see, they can also be helpful in these aquatic situations, even though the, the larvae can't live in water, they can colonize the body when it's floating. So the conclusion to this um, case, 
was that of the insects that were collected, there were many, many, many of all of these groups. Um, and since the lake was cold and it was deep, it would take a long time for that many insects to accumulate on it. And so we figured that it had to be down there for months. It couldn't have just recently drowned because there were way too many insects on it to indicate a very quick death. And the blowflies also, the blowflies, they were primarily those species that are very common in the middle of summer, the height of summer. There were huge numbers of them, indicating that it was a time that the body was floating was a very active insect activity at that time. And so that would not be consistent with what you would see in late fall. That would only be consistent with what you would see in middle of summer. So it all pointed to the fact that the body had been under there for many months and that there, the death must have occurred in the middle of summer. So confronted with this evidence, um, Brian Jones admitted that, yes, um, well, Mike Smith did die in a truck accident in summer and that um, he was, a, Brian was afraid to tell the police, he said, because of the, the truck business that he wasn't supposed to have the truck and Brian was dead anyway. So he decided just to dump the body in the water and was hoping that, that nothing would be discovered. However, um, when the coroner examined the body, he found that Mike wasn't dead when Brian put him in the water, when he pushed him overboard. Because if you drowned, if a person drowns, they take it, they're trying to breathe, they're taking in water, the water goes deep into their lungs, the algae in the water gets caught deep in their lungs. So you can tell if somebody has drowned. Somebody who is dead already when they're placed in the water, this is not going to happen. You will not find these algae embedded deep into their lungs. And so there was clear evidence that he, that Mike Smith had died when he had been pushed into the water. Therefore, Brian had killed him by pushing him overboard. He wasn't just disposing of a dead body, he was killing a man. And so because of that, Brian Jones was charged with murder um, because that's what he had committed. So that's the, um, that's the case. And I'm happy to um, discuss any kind of um, questions that you might have. Does anybody have questions about this? Okay, so um, I'm not sure if I will be seeing questions. Um, okay, but um, I can I can still talk a little more about aquatic entomology. We need much more data, so we need a lot more. Well, we need more research on terrestrial decomposition and the role of insects in it. But but we do have a lot of information there and enough to pinpoint. Um, time of death in many cases. In the aquatic situation, it's often how many are there because often these insects will colonize initially and then build up over time. So at this point, we don't have the discrete stages and the discrete insect fauna that we see on land. We, we need more data. Um, very little research has been done on aquatic um, forensic entomology and we need a lot more of it. Okay, so I, I see a question. It says, oops, wait, it disappeared. <laughs> All right, my question disappeared for a second. Um, I can't see it. All right, let me um, see if I can, oops, wait, there. What would I consider to be the hardest part of my job? Well, um, a lot of it is hard in terms of the identifications because as you have to, the, the collecting is hard because you have to collect insects very carefully and, and again, follow the chain of evidence. And so you have to um, be very careful in collecting and documenting them. Then they have to be, be identified because each species of insect has its own hats. And so if you have 10 different 
midge larvae um, species, then you need to identify that to species. Now, we often use molecular techniques now to get to species, but still, in many cases, the morphological characteristics are very helpful also. So um, identifying the, the insects to species, that can be very tricky. And um, keeping, again, keeping good security, making sure that um, the, the vials are never um, in, a, in a place where they could be compromised, where anybody could tamper with them. So it's all... Um, have to be extremely careful. Can I just, okay, I keep losing the picture, something about the dog. Can I have the question again? <laughs> the, the, the question appears and then it disappears. Um, let me see. Okay, um, trying to see, okay, there. Can I describe how the dog works in the boat on the, I keep losing the, the question. Um, how the dog works in the boat, well, I'm not sure what the rest of the question was. However, um, the dogs are trained. They they know their job. And typical cadaver dogs are like this. They they are very highly motivated to find a body because then they get a reward when they find a body. So these dogs go out on the boat and then they know that they're supposed to pick up an odor that's coming from the water. So their nose is down to the water. They're sniffing the the boat is being steered around likely the areas where a body might be located. And then as soon as the dog detects the, the odor that it's supposed to, it, it gives this yell. And of course it gets rewarded because that's what its job is, is, is to find this body. So um, they're very hardworking, but, but dogs like that love their jobs because again, they like to please, they like to get rewarded and that's how they, that's how they do it. So uh, we, are beginning to take more advantage of dogs' remarkable abilities. For example, um, I, I know some people are testing to see if the dogs can detect coronavirus in people. Um, we know that they can detect hidden diseases. They can detect kidney disease and diabetes and, and all kinds of conditions. So um, the dog's nose is a remarkable instrument. And in this case, we're using, using it to help us solve crimes. And the dog gets something out of it, and certainly the people get something out of it. Okay, what would have happened if the body was found in a hot climate and hot water? Well, again, that's why temperature and depth is so important because um, in, a, in hot water or shallow water, decomposition can occur very, very quickly. And also it depends on who's living in the water. For example, turtles, fish, other animals, if they're very actively feeding, they're always looking for something. If they find a body, that's a rich resource. So you often find a body that is dismembered, um, not because it was dismembered prior to death, but because various scavengers have been tugging on it and, and ripping it apart. So it's, it's much more difficult to identify um, what happened and when in a very um, hot area, you know, hot, hot season, hot water, um, decomposition occurs very quickly. So it's, it's much more difficult. How did I know that I wanted to work on this? Well, I just, um, I love insects and I, I love everything about them. And I've always wanted to work on insects. And this is just such an interesting area because it's, it's helpful you know, in investigations, but it's also just fascinating because we really need to know the life histories of all these insects. Again, we can't just say blowflies do this because there are so many species of blowflies. We have to know how each one behaves. So. There's so much research opportunity there, and they're just um, really fascinating. Now, I do admit um, it can get stinky. I, I often do research with cat food because flies will, you know, colonize cat food in the same way that they would colonize a dead body. And I'll tell you, um, if you've ever smelled cat food after like a day or two, <laughs> like it really smells very disgusting. So um, you have to have a a blind nose to it. I, I once walked into um, my building at school and there was um, cat food in the refrigerator de decomposing away on the other side of the building. And I could smell it when I walked in the door. So um, it, it can be very, very stinky um, and you just have to be able to take it. Now, I actually um, don't work on cases. I do in I, I study cases, but I do investigation of um, the conditions that attract different uh, 
insects like blowflies and like carrion beetles. So I, I do research on it. I don't actually work on case. Again, this was a hypothetical case. Um, and this was based on cases that had been um, worked on in, in the literature. Usually, another aspect of um, forensic entomology is contaminants in food products um, or um, something eating, you know, eating wood earrings or whatever. And, and so I, I have worked on cases like that where we're trying to identify insects, where they came from, essentially, when they started feeding on this material. But in terms of actual dead bodies, I haven't um, worked with real dead bodies, just, just cat food. So again, the blowflies, we, we don't appreciate them um, the way that we should. I think most people think of blowflies as being nuisance. Um, in some cases, blowflies had been revered. Some cultures actually wanted their, their dead relatives to be eaten by blowfly maggots because they believed that when the flies emerged from these maggots, that it was carrying their, their loved one off into the afterlife. So some people have really valued the role of blowflies in decomposition. Uh, most people find it pretty nauseating and, and don't appreciate it. But I like the way that they can do both terrestrial and aquatic. Now, I've lost the question again. It says, what role, but then I've lost the question. Um, okay. What role do turn out types? I lost it again. Can you show it again? <laughs> We're having trouble with these. Okay. Types of um, clothing. Oh, oh absolute speed. In a method of decomposition. Clothing makes a huge difference because um, that can bar various insects from gaining access to the body. So the type of clothing makes a, a big difference. Um, also, people often, they, they anticipate that the body is not going to sink. And so they tie something to it so that the body will sink or they wrap it up in, in wire and attach weight but often the body, the bloat is just so um, so enormous that the body will break free from these chains and then often float to the body with some of these chains attached. So it's very hard to conceal um, a dead body in water, um, even though we see that you know, the, the traditional um, crime syndicates um, like to you know, put people where the fishes swim or whatever, you know, put um, cement shoes on, but. I'm not sure that that is all that helpful. Okay, how helpful are biology and chemistry for solving crimes? You absolutely need both. So it's um, having a background in biology and chemistry, um, especially in forensics, forensics of any kind, not just forensic entomology, but um, chemistry is very essential that you are able to understand chemicals and how they work um, and to analyze DNA so that, that's very critical. And then, of course, biology, understanding the biology of decomposition and, and various organisms that are involved in it is really critical. So I would, if you're at all interested in this field, I would definitely study biology and chemistry and all the other sciences, math and physics, they all play a role. And some of these um, aquatic insects need more research. A, a lot of them have been studied because of people who fish. And again, they're looking for baits because a lot of, a lot of these insects are, are good food for um, fish. And so people have studied them in that regard. But again, just understanding their entire, there's just so much with each insect. Um, it's life history, what it does. Um, it's just so complicated and has taken so many millions of years to evolve. It's just... Um, endless fascination with the lives of all these little creatures. We call insects the little creatures that run the world, thanks to E.O. Wilson, because they do. The world would not exist without them. So it doesn't look like there's any more questions today. Um, but we would like okay. to thank you so much for this presentation. It was so interesting. Thank you. I was very happy to do it. Thank you.